when they're bigger. Yeah, I used I used two 19s at home. Bigger network. Uh, and and a friend of mine down in North Carolina um, bought two 19s on Black Friday, delivered for 140 bucks for the wow. two of them. Oh wow! I missed it. <laughs> so if you can get you can get these things relatively inexpensive. Relatively inexpensive. That gives you your screen space. You can buy one at home and buy one for work, and then you're just carrying the little box but around the door. Or you have work, leave your one on there, and you don't bring your own there. Let them pay for it. If, if they refuse, maybe bring your own. So but if they refuse, that tells you something about them, too. Yeah. It's a slideshow first. Here's the slideshow. And if they don't provide you with a laptop, to do your work there with computer to do your work there. So you, that tells you something also. Art gets a job? Don't know yet. I have not heard. I'm have my fingers crossed for him. My slide show. Green and we have back directory snap-ins. So, good morning. Welcome to John Mason. I'm glad to see you all came back with some more fun. Today we're going to be looking at chapter two of our Active Directory. This is course 7640 Windows Server Active Directory. And it's a great little course. You don't believe me? I'm sorry. Um, so <laughs> Is there anybody that hasn't caught up with the labs from Monday? Okay, not a big deal. I know you can get through it. Basically, all Monday we did was we built our primary server. We added a domain, made it a domain controller. We built a second machine that was a core, no GUI. We added it to domain. We removed it from the domain. That's all it is. But the rest or for the next like four or five or six chapters, you will be doing almost all your work in that one machine. So it will make it easy, but it is accumulative. You can't skip chapter two and then try to do three. It won't work. You're going to be missing some parts. So today, Working with Active Directory snap-ins. We've all been there. What's the first snap-in you used? Computers and users. Yeah. You had to create users, didn't you? Yep. Yeah. That's a snap-in. What is a snap-in? A snap-in is, we'll get to that when it comes up on the slide. Okay. If I can get it to come up on the slide. here, no. Let's see if I can get my slide to actually slide. We're going to talk about identifying the snap-ins within Server Manager and the native consoles used. We're going to look at the RSAT tool. We've talked about RSAT in previous courses. Basically, it is just an administrative tool that we can put on a non-domain controller that gives us access to these tools. It makes it easier for us as a Windows administrator to run it from my laptop without having to log on to a server to go do Active Directory. It's free, downloadable from Microsoft. I'm going to do some form, some of the basic tasks with users and computers. Again, this is where you're going to spend most of your time because that's what you're doing. You're creating users, you're changing users or groups, you're modifying passwords or resetting passwords. Unfortunately, that seems to be a very large part of our job as a system admin. They've locked themselves out or they forgot their password, and we have to go in and reset it for them. We're going to manage, create, manage, and work with the MMC. 
We just did that, didn't we? The uh, Microsoft Management Console, it is the core of this snap-in configuration. And not all snap-ins are there by default. They do that on purpose, and we'll see why. We're going to launch Admin Tools. Remember this, run as administrator. Windows has added a separate or a new layer of protection that people can't just get access to a command prompt remotely somehow and force it to install or do administrative tasks. We actually have to go tell the tool, notepad, command prompt, and there are a bunch of others that we want to run in privileged mode or or admin mode. And we do that by right clicking on the icon and then le left click on the run as administrator. If they can't do that, they can't run whatever you're trying to do. Now, that also means if you enter a command and it doesn't work, double check yourself, make sure you just didn't click on the icon. There is a way to turn your icon, set the properties to always do this. I don't recommend doing it because it totally defeats the purpose of why they put it there. Now, if you're 100% positive nobody's ever going to get onto your system to have access to your servers, that's your decision. <clears throat> I don't do it. I'd rather run as administrator and give that extra layer which they gave me on purpose. Get a blank slide. I don't know why. So understand what the MMC is. Windows administrative tools share a common framework. We call it the Microsoft Management Console. Simple enough. In other words, somebody's gone out and made all these little GUI screens for us. The MMC displays administrative calls uh, tools called snap in. And if we go, when we log on to our servers, everybody get up the server going, get it to server 01. Now, another note about this chapter and some of the chapters that we're going to be hitting in the very near future. Within the reading of the chapter, they go through the steps of how to do things. You do not do those as your labs. They are not labs. They're just the steps on how to do it. At the end of the chapter, you will do the labs, and it probably will have the exact same thing, with the exception it will have the information for the labs based on the service we've built, where in the middle of the chapter, it might not. Also, in the middle of the chapter, it doesn't know if you've done previous prerequisites from previous chapters. So just be aware of that. So has everybody got a server up and running and we're all looking in front of it? Okay, let me know when you have your servers up. I'm just going to put one up here. I might have to remember to bounce between screens if I forget. Just remind me. But as we can see, I just brought up the server that you guys all log on to to get into your VM. The only difference is when I logged in, I have full admin rights because I'm the administrator, and you're not. So you're not going to get to see all the tools that we get to play with. And this guy isn't the one I want to be in because he's not the domain controller. I want the DC. So let me just kick over to a DC. I 
you need to make trolling. Are you going into 173.13.106.19? Oh, yeah, not that. Okay. 192.168.2020. Double check your password. Retype your password. Capital P A S S W 0 R D. Connecting, connecting, connecting. I've typed it in twice already. It's okay. Let's just see if we get it. Maybe, stop. maybe the third time's a charm. John, who are you logging into? 20, 20, no, should I be 20, 20, uh, 2025? You're 2025. You're 2025. Okay, I'm 22. 22. 22. Is that true? No, you're not 22. There's no 22 um, VM server. You should be in 20.20. .20. Okay. Right. Can I sit for a second? Just let me be back. Yesterday from home, it took a long time to walk through up for me. And this morning, when I first logged on here, it took a few minutes after I touched the password. They shouldn't be all that slow. What could, what could be causing a little of our bandwidth issue? Uh, no, we're running running on three computers right now. Know what happened, but it happened. So you should now be on, and I am on, and I'm going to just go pick up our. We look, we have our Active Directory users, and I'm going to pick him, open him up, just so that we can see the pain. We're going to be feeling the pain of this in a little while. Fun, fun. <laughs> so on the left hand side, we have our console tree. Right now, I am looking at the classroom domain. You should be looking at your own domain. Under your domain, if you expand it by hitting the plus sign, if you don't see it, you should have a bunch of information here within the console. Yes? Yes or no? Are you talking about my, my snapping? Cancel. Cancel. Wow. Close the sky. Close that guy. Go to start. Administrative tools. And click on the open the users and computers. Active directory users and computers. Should bring you this guy. No? I don't have it. Did you make your no. guy a domain controller yet? Sure. That's why. If he's not a domain controller, he will not have this capability. And that's a good thing. 
That way somebody that gets onto a member server someplace, which we could give an individual access administrative tech privileges to a member server, and what he's doing could be in development, testing within a domain environment. He can't break our Active Directory. So under here, we also have the center pane. And within the center pane, we have the exact same thing. Now, I'm going to just double click on users here. We see a whole bunch of users. And then if I pick, oh, say, Art, he's not here, but we can open Art. And there's his account with every all the information necessary. Now, at some point, we might actually see a right pane. He's not showing up right now because we don't have anything that needs it. But there could be an action pane way over on the right. If the action pane's there, it allows us to do something. But we also have the same capabilities from up here. We also have the same capabilities by right clicking. So Microsoft provides us many ways to work within these tools. And no way is wrong if it does what you need it to do. I mean, I can come up here and click on new user. I can come down here and click in here someplace and probably create a new user. If I don't have somebody selected, that is. I can also, I believe, come up here and go to new user. So there's a bunch of ways for us to play with this. i got to get back into my focus here so I can see what the next screen is, hopefully. And I don't see the next screen. Let me minimize this guy for a couple seconds. So, most Active Directory administration tasks are performed in some of the following snap-ins. And there's a bunch of them, and no two snap-ins really can do the same thing. If I'm going to work with users, i got to be using users' computers. Okay, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. So what do they give us? Users and computers, sites and services, domains and trusts, schema, and then finally we have our RSAT, Remote Server Administration Tool. The Snap-in console are installed when we promote a server to the Active Directory or Domain Services role. If he's not a domain server, he has no business needing all this information. But remember, when you do build a server, it still has its own local users and groups. If we're logging into the server itself, not the domain, we still need an admin account. We need that admin password. And we can do quite a bit with it. But once we log on to the domain, the local permissions don't mean a thing. You're going to get what the domain gives you. RSAT allows you to uh, administrate active directories from a system that is not a DC. And once installed, snap-ins are found under Administrative Tools folder. So when you click on Start Administrative Tools, you should see all the lists. If you add some and you save it, it should pop up there. Or you could save it to your, to your desktop or a local folder someplace. And the schema snap-in must be registered before you can add it to the console. Again, they're making schema where we can't get to it unless we really know what we're doing because we don't want anybody touching it to break it. They break our schema, you're going to be in trouble. So how do we create a custom admin? It allows us to add multiple snap-ins to the same console. There might be a time I want to give somebody access to something without giving them everything. We can create a custom console for them. Uh, save consoles you use regularly. Again, you can go in, 
add the snap in for schema, do some work, but don't save it. That way the next person can't stumble across it. If you need it again, you just go at it again to do what you need. However, if you find yourself using schema all the time, you save it so you don't have to go through the whole steps each time. You distribute con consoles to other administrators. Again, I don't want the junior admins to have schema, but there's two senior admins that I know need it because we're a big company and they're backups for each other. We're going to give them access to those. We have the capability to distribute it to distribute what we want to anybody that's there. And we can save in a shared location. That means I tell you go to our admin folder and in our admin folder are all our shortcuts. You get to see what I'm letting you see. So to create an MMC, uh, a custom MMC, we're going to go to MMC. So we'll open that up. Kurt, since you can't, I'm going to put it up on the board for you. So we're going to close this guy. We don't need him right now. We're going to go to start. Type MMC in our little search box. So we're going to the start menu. The start. You're going to go and click the start on your server. We did this last one. Yeah, I know that. And then you're going to go MMC. We just did that yeah. a little while ago, Pat. Yeah. And now we're going to see our screen. And what are we going to do with that? I have no idea because I'm going to go look. File, add and remove snap-in, and then the snap-in box appears, and we have the capability to do quite a bit within here. We can add, we can remove, we can reorder, or we can manage the snap-ins that we see. So, let me see if I can get back to my snap-ins just for a quick peek. Go to file. Add a room snap ins. And here are our snap ins. And as you can see, some of these we already have. I have domains and trusts here. <coughs> I have users and computers, and I already have it in my administrative tools. But if I want to create a custom and give somebody else access to things, this is where I'm going to be playing with it. I'm just going to throw him in here for the time being. And as they say, I have, I can edit, I have permissions I can do within here. If I had multiples, I can move them up or down. I can remove him. And I even have an advanced button. We're not going to play with it because I don't want to break anything on my server. Because this is actually a live server that you guys <coughs> have used to authenticate and log in. So we're not going to break anything. Yes, Pat? I'm not sure where you're at. Okay, Are you in the MMC. <coughs> okay, go to start. No, no on your server, not on the PC. Oh, okay. No. That will make a big difference. Yeah. Then in in your yep, yeah, MMC there. Enter. Now if you go to file, okay. add a root step ins, that's where we are. So we can also save these things. If you click File, Save, and it will say, where do you want to save it? What do you want to name it? And again, you don't have to do it now because you're going to do it in your labs. I'm just showing it to you. When we create these, we want to click as Run as an Administrator when we go to Run our Save. Snap in. And the user account control box will appear. If it does, say, yes, I want to give it permission. Again, that's that extra step of security they gave us. Then we can click use another account if we have to. We can enter credentials that has administrative privileges so that we can tell it, yes, we are really domain admins, and we want to be able to go do this. We're just not John Smith, the janitor. And then when we click OK, we're into it. Piece of cake. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, I got to that part. Yep. And 
where it says right click the shortcut for an executable. Okay, we haven't I couldn't. We haven't created one yet. Oh, okay. Again. Don't do the steps here. <laughs> do them in the lab at the okay. end of the chapter. They're just telling you what the steps would be because oh, okay. that's what they're trying to show us. This is one of the most important things in Active Directory. How to get in, modify, change, save, and configure Active Directory. And these are the tools we need. So don't do them here. So there are four modes in which we can uh, use when we create custom, direct, uh, custom consoles. I'm sorry. We have author. We have user mode full access. We have user mode limited access with multiple windows. And we have user mode limited access with a single window. Depending on who and what we're given will depend here on what we give them. You're not going to give full access to somebody that you want to be able to have the capabilities to reset a password. It doesn't make sense. Nor do you want to give your senior tech limited access. He ain't going to be able to do anything without keep pounding you until you give him the right permissions. Or he's going to be like, when you give user mode full access, does that... Um, we'll hit them in a second. Okay. Author mode, what does it do? Use when you want to continue to customize the console. You're the author of it. You get to go in and change it to your needs. Full access. You want users of this console to be able to navigate between and use all snap-ins. Piece of cake. Users, okay. users in this mode do not have permissions to add or remove. All they can do is use. If somebody needed to add or remove, we got to go back with author mode. And that means somebody that already has that permission. Users cannot change the properties of the snap-ins or the console. What you get is what you get. They can run them. Limited mode with multiple windows. If you want users to navigate and use uh, only the snap-ins that are made visible. In other words, they don't have the capability to go add another one if they need to see it. They're stuck here, which is good. You want to pre-configure multiple windows and focus on specific snap-ins. And users cannot open new windows here. They're limited, but they get multiple windows. They can see multiples. They just can't add more than what you've given them. Limited mode with a single window. Users can navigate this and use only the snap-in that you have made visible within that single window. That's it. Very limited. That's the type of thing we might give a help desk person who has to go reset password. So, the summary here, administrative tools are snap-ins that can be added to our MMC. AD users and computers and other Active Directory Management Console snap-ins are also added to Server Manager and are contained in pre-configured consoles in the administrative tools. We saw those. Um, Sites and services, domains and trusts. If we add something that needs a snap-in or install something that needs a snap-in, it will put it there for us, with the exception of schema. We have to do schema ourselves. And you're going to do it in the lab, so don't worry about it. What else did we have? Administrators should not log on to their computers with administrative credentials. Why? Because if somebody else is watching, we don't want to give them the keys. Instead, they should use a standard user account and log on and launch administrative tools in the run as administrator. When you do it this way, it is going to prompt you for a username and password because their standard account does not have permissions. So. I log on 
is Kirk. And then when I go to open something, it's going to say, okay, Kirk, you don't have permissions. Give me a username. Now I can type Ed Kirk Admin and my special password for Kirk Admin. Now I get escalated to those. I can open that console, but the only time I'm putting the Kirk Admin password in is when I need to use a domain tool. The other nice thing about that is record keeping, auditing. We've talked about it, and we're going to talk about it again at some other point. I want to know who logged in and who made these changes and at what time. If everybody logs on as administrator, I don't know if it was Kirk or if it was John that made that change. But if you log in as yourselves, I now have explicit records on who's doing what. Okay? So, especially in large companies, nobody uses administrator. Don't want them. You want to have your own accounts. It is recommended that you save a console in user mode so that the changes cannot be made to the console or its snap-ins. User mode they can't change, author mode they can. Create a snap-in that contains all snap-ins you require to perform a job. So if I want you to have three and three only, I'm going to create a custom snap-in for that purpose. That's what I'm giving you. That's what you get, nothing else. And such console can be saved in a location where you and possibly other administrators can access it with administrative credentials. Boy, we keep pushing that one point, don't we? I wonder why. And this should be the only tool you need to run as administrator if you have fully customized it. Once you open that snap-in, if you've used your admin password to get into there, you have admin privileges to everything under that snap-in that's been created. You don't have to keep adding your password if you swap between snap-ins. Consoles require that you have the appropriate administrative tools be installed, otherwise the snap-in won't work. For some reason, if there's something that happened, the snap-in doesn't work because somebody uninstalled it, but the snap-in was saved in a custom and it wasn't removed, it ain't going to work. It's like I have the key to the car, but I sold the car. The key ain't going to do me a bit of good. Objects in Active Directory. Now we'll get a little deeper. Create users, groups, computers, and organizational units. OUs become very big within this, especially when we start looking at domain policies. Disable protection to delete an organizational unit. In the old days, again, we assigned all kinds of things to organizational units included policies. You could delete an organizational unit and because it's part of Active Directory there's no oops button and because of all the security IDs that are put on it you can't just create it with the same name. Everything's gone because it gets a new SID. So now there is a automatic protection that if we want to delete something we have to go do another step so it can't be deleted by accident. That's a very big thing here, especially if you're in a large organization and you wipe out the organizational unit for North America. Would it be a good thing? Probably would be job. <laughs> After you fix it. Yeah. You can customize and take advantage of views and features within the Active Directory uses a computer snap in work effectively or efficiently with objects and we can create saved queries. We're going to talk about queries to provide rule-based views of objects. So what's an organizational unit? We're going to, it's going to be called OU through the book, COU, no OU, organizational unit. 
They are administrative containers that Active Directory or inactive directory that are used to collect objects that share common requirements, configurations, or visibilities. It's almost like a group on steroids. <laughs> OUs provide an administrative hierarchy similar to the folder hierarchy of our disk drive. And OUs create collections of objects that belong together for administrators. Just a wee bit. But let me tell you, when I came in yesterday morning, it was freezing. So, to create an organizational unit. You want to know how tough this is? We're going to open the user's computer, snap it. Okay, that was, we've already there, you have it open. We're going to right click on a domain or an organizational unit that we want to use. And I'm going to bring it up here and I'm going to get rid of this thing if I can find it. And I'm going to get rid of this thing if we don't need it. And I'm going to bring up I don't know why I'm getting cross, right, because I have 16 windows open. But if here is my domain, Classroom John Mason Institute, yours would be your name. If I right click on him, I got new, and in new, I get organizational <laughs> unit. I can create one there. If I have an OU down here, I can go to new. And I should be able to put, but this isn't, a, this isn't an organizational unit, I'm sorry. But there is capability to put an organizational unit under an organizational unit. It's just a hierarchy. Let's go back to our enterprise environment. Headquarters is in Maidenhead, England. Uh, Pat, just so you know, that's where my last headquarters was. I worked for Multi. We have an organizational unit for... Europe, an organizational unit for Asia, and an organizational unit for North America. Under North America, we had Canada and the U.S. Under the U.S., we had whatever six or eight or ten companies, divisions we had here. They can control everybody in the U.S. at that level, or they can control people or things at a city or what we used to call house, because in England everything was a house. I don't know why. And everybody got a house name. We were Granite House, because it's the Granite State. Colorado was Flat Iron. I don't know what the hell it means, but that's what they were. Flat Iron State. Yeah, something stupid like that. And, um, but like they had the Boat House. Now, when I went to Sheffield, one of the houses that they were in it's like 150 years old, and it's been called this house for 150 years. So it, it, it ends up maintaining or still using that same technology. And actually, when you sent mail, you that was like part of the address. Boathouse, you know, made in that England. So to add these things is relatively easy. Now, let's make sure I'm still here. We're going to type the name of the organizational unit that we so desire. We're going to select Protect Container from Accidental Deletion. We want to make sure that is on. Because if we want to turn it off, then we can get rid of it. Then after that, we click OK and power it's done. That's too difficult, John. So, we can right click on the organizational unit that we created. And again, you're going to do this in your lab, so you don't do it now. And we click properties. The properties has set properties is defined by naming convention and other standards or processes in your organization. No two organizations are going to be the same. This is what you need your things to do. And after we're there, we're going to click OK. Pow. We've created it. To protect it, this adds a safety switch to our organizational unit so they can't be accident accidentally deleted. 
Two permissions are added to the organizational unit. And within there, we're going to see everyone deny delete and everyone deny delete subtree. Subtree means anything below. So if I have an organizational unit North America and then I have an organizational unit Canada and US in there, if I delete or try to delete North America and there are subtrees there, it's not going to let me do it unless it allows me to do it. You've probably tried that in, in some types, especially in the older DOS world. You try to delete or remove a folder and there's files in it and they will let you do it. Because it's, wait a minute, you sure you want to do this? Today we can do it real easy. You just delete the whole folder and everything that's below it. Of course, you can get it back easy. Gosh, you couldn't. So this is a way to help ensure we don't break something important. And no user, not even administrators, will be able to delete the OU or its content accidentally as long as this is set. You have to physically go change that before you can do it. So creating a user. Again, you've already done it. You're going to do it a couple more times. It's relatively simple. We're going to go into users and computers. We're going to go to the UO, the organizational unit or a container. Right now, if you look, there's some folders within your um, organization. You have users, you have groups, you have built-in. Those are containers. When you create a new user, you're going to put them in a user's container. You might put them in a different container. You shouldn't be able to delete these either, nor should you want to. So we're going to right-click the container and point to new and then click user. As I said before, there are multiple ways. There's a little button up on the top that has a single person. That's new user button. You see the one next to it that has two people? That's a group. So you just have to push the button. We're going to enter the appropriate account information. It doesn't need much to create the user. However, after you create them, you're probably going into this properties to make appropriate changes. So review our summary and click finish. Create in a group. Exact same thing. We'll go with the users and computer snap in. We're going to go where we want to create the group. Right click, point new. Enter the appropriate information. Review and finish. We're done. Hey, created a computer. Want to make a bet? It's the same thing. The first question you say, well, why do I need to create a computer object? When you add a system to a domain, an object's created because it has to keep track of that computer. We'll see that we can pre-stage these things. Meaning, I can pre-stage, build out all my computer objects that are laptops and automatically put them into the right container so that when we add it, we don't have to go change it later. Or, if we add the computer through a normal add to a domain, we'll just have to go in and put them in the proper container later. Many ways to do many things. So again, computer objects, users and computers. Makes sense. We're going to go to the OUO container where we want to create this. Close. Looks like we have a CCNA class coming up. We're going to right click the container, point to new, click computer. We're going to add the appropriate. Uh, user account information for this device and then we're going to look at the summary and finish we're done but anything that we do within Active Directory here you want to create an organizational unit you want to create a, uh, a container any of it it's the same process so finding objects this time Depending on the size, 
could get a little more complex. If you have 100 users, it shouldn't be difficult to find Jenny Jones. If you have 500,000 users because you're GM, you might have a little more problem. But you can locate objects in Active Directory on many occasions. And we're going to use um, We want to find them so that we can grant permissions, so that we can add members to groups, so that we can create links and look up an object. So if you know the name of the object you want, we can enter it and select a text box and do a search. Piece of cake. And guess what? For our labs, we have like five or eight users. You don't have to go through all this, but it's there. Multiple names can be separated by a semicolon. So if you want to add J. Jones and you want to add a second one, you put a semicolon and type B. Butler. He's in there too. Also. Click OK. The window looks up the items listed. The name, uh, check names button also converts each name to a link. We'll be seeing this in the labs. And by default, selected dialog box searches the entire domain. Again, you can go down a layer and search within a container, an organizational unit, yada, yada. But by default, it's going to start looking every place. If we're having troubles, we can click the advanced. Find now button, it will just list everything alphabetically and we can go through there. And we've all seen that in the past. Advanced view allows you to search both name and description fields. Now, description fields helps if we have two or three people that have the same name. It could happen. When I was on the ship, there were four people with the last name Reed. They all had the same first name. They were all spelled differently though. I had an R-E-I-D, an R-E-E-D, and you know, but it's real easy to make a mistake. This will let us look and oh, this is that one instead of this one. Because we're telling, hey, he's in accounting. Oh, we know we're working on our accountants because we're laying them off because we don't need them. We want to make sure we don't lay off the one that's the vice president of charge of bus who's going to be pissed at us when his name shows up on a list. We don't want to do that. Some of the fields on the common queries tab might be disabled. So on the view menu, we're going to click advanced features and click find properties. We'll do this in the labs. We're just looking at the steps. And we have the AD search, uh, Active Directory Domain Services Toolbar, and we can use that to form a search on objects. We can right-click an object, click Properties, and then click the Object tab. Canonical name. Anybody remember canonical name? A C name. We use that a lot when we're doing like uh, aliases in DNS. So, relative distinguished names is a portion of our um, domain name prior to the first organizational unit. So, if we have our domain, and I'm going to call it Contasso, that's our domain, right? Fully qualified domain name. That would be my fully qualified domain name, wouldn't it? My user, mlornmcortoso.com. The relative part is whatever is before my namespace. Now, they say an organizational unit. Let me add one step here.
my organizational unit would be Nashua, because that's where we were located. My relative name is still the stuff that is before the first organizational unit. This would go two, three, four, five levels down. So this is our relative distinguished name. And look at this, I even put an example here. John Mason, comma, organizational unit is user accounts, jmi.com. And John Mason would be the relative distinguished name. Common name. So now they want to say distinguished names and understand we're not going to see this too much in real, real life because normally we don't think at this level. We just think of the user level. So distinguished names. We have relative distinguished names. We have common names. And each time when we do these, know where you're going to see these the most? When you're doing your command line. When you're doing PowerShell and you have to type CN equals contorso.com, comma, DC equals something. That's where you're going to be seeing or understanding this the most or using it the most. The GUI already brings us to where we need to be. We had that last time with that right. Yeah, you remember that. Those are the ones that we usually had the most problems with because it was usually a typo on a space or something. And it was type that out like that in the command line? In the command line you had to. How come they separate the dot com part? Because it is still a separate part of what happens if I have a company that has a dot com and a dot net? Oh, okay, yep. It is a part of the distinguished name, but it is only a part. I think we're going to see that coming up here. So, distinguished names are a kind of path to an object in Active Directory. It's telling us how to get there. Each object in Active Directory has a completely unique distinguished name. Again, we're going to look at our user, John Mason. It has a distinguished name of... C name, John Mason, organizational unit, DC is JMI, DC is COM. That is his full distinguished name. Now, if we were going to write it out without this, it would be John Mason uses, yeah, yeah, yeah. We could find that in Active Directory relatively quickly, couldn't we? We know, hey, we're going into the JMI.com domain when we have our users and computers up. We know we're going to go to the user accounts organizational unit and that's where John should be found. If he is it, we've made a mistake someplace. The DN is a path starting at the object and working to the top level domain. Starting here, John Mason, users, jmi.com. C name or common name is the information that you add to a full name box when you create the user. Relative domain names are usually common names. It's the same thing. It's the same user. I create a, 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 an account for Jenny Jones. Her common name is Jenny Jones. Command line. We can also do quite a bit of this from command line. Why do we care about command line? Because we can run scripts in command lines. Where if we do it in the GUI, we're doing them one at a time. Perfect example for this. You work at a high school. It's now August 2012. You have 800 seniors just graduated, you have 800 freshmen coming in, and you have to make sure that 
the juniors go up to the seniors and the sophomores go to the juniors and now you have new freshmen. Do you want to do this one account at a time? No. Do you want to move all these people one account at a time? We found out five guys didn't graduate and they're staying back to be seniors. We got to go find those five guys in our group of 800 to make sure they don't get thrown away. The DS query is going to help us quite a bit. He can go find things for us. Many DS commands are the command line tools that perform similar functionality to the user interface uses in computer snapping. If we use the DS query with a slash question mark, it will tell us what commands we're looking for. You don't have to type exe. If you type DS query and it can find it, it knows it's an executable. Otherwise, you couldn't get an error. Because you can't run dsquery.dll. You can't run a QS DS query something else. If by chance it's text, it's going to open Notepad. Well, that ain't an executable. It's a file. It's a document. It knows the executable. It knows it's an exe. So we can use it to find many objects. There's the key. DS query can be used to locate, let's see, users, groups, organizational units. In my scenario of school, my organizational units are going to be graduation year. That way I don't have to move the, you know, I don't want freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, because every year I'd have to keep moving everybody. If I say class of 13, class of 12, class of 11, class of 10, they're in there unless I have to move somebody out of the class. Those don't change. When they become seniors, they're still the class of 13. And that would be the group. Organizational unit. That would be the organizational unit. Yes. Groups I might get into honors, intermediate, football team. No, I put football team as a group because I know that they're going to need remedial and extra help. So, DS query, if we want to look for the name John, it will find any John and Dick and Harry. So, that wasn't really that bad, was it? What did we really look at? Organizational units are administrative containers that collect objects that share similar requirements. They're the class of 2013. I know they're all going to be seniors this year. I know in junior year, they're all going to get their class ring. And if I can keep track, because they're all sharing this common thing, Juniors, they're going to take what? Their PSATs, and seniors, they're going to take their SATs. They're sharing a common need. It's easy to find. Who's taking PSATs out of the 2,500 students we have this year? Here's your list. Organizational units provide a way to access and manage collections of users, groups, computers, or other objects. And oh, you cannot be given permissions to resources. Organizational units do not get permissions. They get policies. And we'll see this later, but there's a big difference. To disable protection, you must turn off, that should be turn off, advanced features in the view and then we're going to go into the properties of our organizational unit. And then we can go to the uh, object tab and deselect the protection button. It's not easy. Well, it's really not difficult, but it's not something that it's, people are just going to be able to click on. They have to go to it. So this, again, 
prevent somebody from accidentally unchecking the box that will allow the deletion of an organizational unit. When you create an object such as a user, computer, or a group, you can configure only a limited number of the properties when you configure it. After you configure that object, you are going to go back into the properties of it and add more. So when you create new user, what does it allow you to add? It wants a username. It wants a full name. It wants a password. Then it gives you four blocks. Change password at next login. It gives you the block to um, disable password change. It gives you the block that password never expires. It gives you the block that says the account is locked. That's all you get. How do I put them into the class of 2013? We have to go back into it after it's created and we can make it a member of a group. We can't do that on an initial configure. It provides only limited. And they do that on purpose. That way we can't just go create a bunch of these and say forget, damn, they all have administrative rights because somebody typed something wrong. Not a good thing. You have to go back in. Again, with a script we can do it through our DS control or we go into the account individually. And you're going to do that in your lab. Okay? You're going to have to make, make are we still using Kim Akers in this one? I don't remember. No. But you have to go make a new user and you have to give them domain admin privileges. You can't do it when you create the account. Object properties such as description, managed by, and notes can be used. Those are helpful to us. We want to do a, a progress or a report. Who works for maintenance? Well, who's their manager? John Smith. Let's go find all the people that are under John Smith. Managed by. We can do quite a, quite a bit here. Of course, we still have to go put that information in. It doesn't get generated automatically. Object properties such as description. Hey, I just saw this one. Yeah. I think what happens is they get cut out from the bottom of the last one. By default, organizational units are created with protection. Can't just believe them. Delegation and security of uh, Active Directory objects. We're going to look at, describe the business purposes of delegation. Assign permissions to Active Directory objects using Security Editor, User Interface, and the Delegation of Control Wizard. Wizards can be our friend. All we have to do is enter information that the wizard asks for. We can view and report permissions of Active Directory objects, and permissions will come a headache for us. Because if we have a user in two different groups with conflicting privileges, they're either going to be able to do something they shouldn't, or they're not going to be able to do something that they should, and it's going to be a bear to find it, especially in a large organization. We're going to evaluate effective permissions for a user or group. Again, normally we want to put permissions where? On a user or a group? User. Group. Oh, yep. and you put the users in that I group. I put the users in that group. That way, if I delete the user from the group, everybody else still there has the permissions. And if I want to give permissions to somebody new, all I have to do is dump them in the group. So you would only put that user in a group that's going to have those permissions. That needs those that permissions. Needs those. And again, think of it this way. Would you rather set permissions on your 800 seniors or on the group mm -hmm. for the 800 seniors? Right. So we can reset the permissions of an object to its default. We can describe the relationship between delegation and organizational unit design. And now we've got to understand delegation. Anybody have an idea what delegation is? Rolls downhill, that's for sure. Especially when it doesn't work. Applying privileges or 
permissions to permissions. different people? We're going to give somebody permission to do something. We're going to delegate the job. I'm the manager. I'm not doing the work. I have five techs below me. Hey, Kirk, you go build that server. John, I need you to go add 300 users. I'm not doing it. That's why I got you guys. If somebody has a problem, then you'll come up and I'll tell you how to do it. But I'm not going to do it. We delegate the jobs. That's what managers do so that we don't have to do it. My time as a senior engineer shouldn't be wasted resetting passwords. And we have 5,000 kids in the school, and every day we get about 100 requests because they've blocked out their accounts. Should that be where I'm spending my time? No. I can hire a junior engineer or a tech support or a help desk. I can let the secretary do it. You know, their time might not be as valuable, especially when it comes to pay-wise. Where, do you want me to spend three hours a day resetting passwords, then building the servers and maintaining the infrastructure, which is my job? Of course, I still don't have to know how to do it. But when I was a junior engineer, I did it. So I know how to do it. Delegation is said to be scoped or given. We've seen the word scoped before. DHCP, we scope a set of IP addresses. These are the IP addresses that can be given. Permissions are scoped. We're going to delegate these permissions. You've been given these permissions. They're just scoped. It's just a, a, a term that they use in the IT field. Permissions on an object called access control entries, ACEs. And they are assigned to users, groups, or computers. These are called security principles. They're people we can assign permissions. Notice organizational unit is not here. We don't assign permissions to OUs. We assign users, groups, computers, entities. So, we can also view our access control lists, our ACLs, open our users and computers. Again, we've been in here a couple of times. On the view menu, we have to select the advanced features. By default, this guy is not turned on. Once you've turned them on, he stays turned on. So you're just going to go to view, you're going to see advanced features there, you're going to click it, it will put a little check. It now sees more things than you saw without it. Yes, it does. So, we're going to right click on an object, any object a user, choose properties. From there, we're going to click the security tab. And under the security tab, there should be an advanced button. Yes, you with me? Here, we can see granular ACEs of permission entries. Granular. What do you think of when I say granular? A piece of sand. I can get down to the piece of sand size for setting permissions. Meaning I can give John a whole separate specific permissions different from everybody else. Or I can give the whole group the same thing. But John's special. He's gotten a star. He's moved to the head of the class. Good job, John. I just delegated more permissions to him, so I had to make him a little more granular. I can be that specific. We have a discretionary ACL of an object that allows you to assign permissions to specific properties of that object. A discretionary ACL. Permissions can be an allow or a deny. Where have we seen that before? ACLs, allows, denies? Doesn't matter if it's networking or system admin. It's the same thing. If you're allowed to do something, you can. If you're not, you can't. Permissions can also be assigned 
to manage control access rights. And permissions can be assigned to objects. Objects are just something in Active Directory. You have the permission to use that printer. So how do we assign these things? We're going to open the user's computer snapping. Boy, we keep coming back to that guy, don't we? Of course, it's all it is in Chapter 2. We're going to look at the view and ensure that the advanced feature is selected. It will be selected. Once you've done it, it doesn't go away. But if something isn't showing up, check it. Right-click on the object and left-click on properties. Same thing, no different. Go to go to the security tab and then the advanced button. We can click add and with here we can select the uh, security principles to which permissions are to be set. You'll do it in your lab. So, configure the permissions we want to assign. Again, we can be very granular here. Click OK. We're done. Now here's a thought of a granular. Everybody has a password policy. Password policy says minimum of eight characters. You need at least three of the four um, character sets that we use. Lowercase, uppercase, numbers, or special characters which are accepted. Some are, you can't use special, some special characters in a password. By default, our policy says you need to use at least three. And if you think about it, we use password, capital P. I hit my capitals. The number zero, I hit two. Lowercase, there, I hit three out of the four, I'm set. I want administrators to use 10 or 12 characters. I'm going to be more granular for those specific accounts because I want them more difficult to hack. Because if somebody gets in, hey, they, get, they can go up to the crown jewels here. They get an administrator password. Not as bad if they get the users. User has limited privileges. <coughs> so there's a lot we can start doing with these things. Inheritance. Inheritance. Anybody have an idea what that's going to cause us headaches with? Sub. Subs. Subs inside the they're in the lower. All lower. You inherit what your parents give you. Of course, my parents have nothing, so I didn't get anything. But if there are permissions set at a unit above where you are, you can inherit those permissions. And again, this is where we could run into problems. I'm in two groups. One has allow, one has a deny. Who's going to win? Deny. Deny is going to win. Oh yes, always, always towards the lesser trouble you're going to give me. If I have somebody that says, allow administrative privileges and deny administrative privileges, I want that deny to win. Because I don't want the janitor to have administrative privileges because somebody dragged him into the wrong group. Child objects inherit permissions of parent containers, organizational units, or the domain. Now again, why are we saying the domain? Why would we go that high? Well, that's real simple. I want everybody to have the same exact background on their computer. I don't want to find little puppies, and I don't want to have sunshine faces, especially when my sales guys are going out and they're turning on their computer, and they're putting a projector, and they have the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders as their background. Yeah. <laughs> it's always his fault. Now, would that be appropriate in, you know, I put up a picture, there's my background, and there's some questionable desktop. At my domain level, I'm forcing everybody to have the company logo. It's not their computer, it's my computer. I'm the company. We can go down a little lower. Maybe I'm going to just say, hey, anybody in the organizational unit traveling salespeople 
have to get a generic vanilla, I'm, you know, something that's not going to get me in trouble. I can go up to the container. There's all places we can do it. Get, we can get very granular. Or we can do it for the entire beach. Everybody in the sandbox, same thing. Not every permission is inheritable. And by default, new objects inherit inheritable permissions from their parent. In other words, if there's already something in there, I create a new user and put it underneath someplace in there, pow, he gets those permissions. That way I but can't... If not every permission is inheritable... We'll hit some of those. <laughs> yeah. there, are some, there are some that you can't get. And again... There's certain privileges you want to make sure aren't. So, what if a permission that is being inheritable, inherited is not appropriate? Good question. We have the capability to disable inheritance. We have the capability to allow inheritance, but override the inherited permission with permissions assigned specifically to a child object. So they're in the class of 2013, and they're in um, the football team. They might get some type of difference. We're not going to let them get inherited. And we can change the scope of inheritance on the parent permission. Sometimes that might be the right thing to do. Why did you give the entire football team administrative privileges? Oops. Could happen. Of course, most of them wouldn't know how to do anything with it because they're still busy reading CJ and Run. I can be. Viewing and uh, reporting and viewing permissions. This is important to us because when something isn't working, we have to go to try to find it. When you have a small organization, there might not be a lot to look for. But if we go back to our high school class, hey, we've talked about the classes of 10, 11, 12, and 13, haven't we? Who haven't we talked about? Teachers, administrative staff, cafeteria staff, secretaries, janitors. It's not just the class. There's a lot of other things that we have to be aware of. So we're going to have to sometimes go look and see what things are set to so that we can either verify they work or change them. We can view permissions on a discretionary ACL. And there's even a DS ACL command tool. You'll probably see that in your lab. <clears throat> Removing or resetting permissions of an object. Again, this could be very important. There is no undelegate. Once we delegate something, we can't undelegate it. We're going to have to remove them from something. We're going to open our advanced security settings permissions, and then we're going to use the restore default button to reset to the default permission. We can select or deselect permissions as appropriate. So we might be resetting to default, then adding something right back in. Something that might be less um, privileged than we accidentally set to. Understanding our effective permissions. Effective permissions. <clears throat> They're the resulting permissions of a security principle, a user, a group, a computer on cumulative effects of each inherited and explicit access control entry. Okay? Effective. That means once I take everything, they're in this group, they're in this organizational unit, they're in this group, these are everything that he has. It covers the whole shebang. 
And this is what we're going to look to see if we have conflicts, by the way. Permissions that allow access are cumulative. Permissions that deny access override equivalent allow permissions. We want to block if we make a mistake. Better safe. You know, let's close and lock the safe instead of leaving it open over the weekend. Nobody should be able to get it. Explicit permissions can override inherited permissions. Explicit, I am giving it to you, Stephen. You're getting this. I don't care what the inherited, you're in that group, I don't care. You need this to do your job, you get it. That's explicit. Objects can be administered the same way as admins should contain in an organizational unit. Objects that will be administered the same way by the same admins should be in the same containers. Once you're there, it's set up, only you guys are going to deal with it, nobody else has to. Of course, you know there's always a senior that's going to have access to everything. We're going to design our organization units first to enable the effective permissions. We're going to delegate what we want the class of 2013 to do. We have to build that organizational unit class of 2013 before I can do anything to it. I can't put users, I can't put groups into it. It doesn't exist. Then we're going to refine the design to facilitate configuration of computers and users through group policies. I told you a little while ago, group policies are assigned to organizational units, not to users, not to computers, not to groups. Permissions are assigned to users, groups, and containers. Policies are going to organizational units sites and domains. So another real informative lesson we went through, we're just cranking these out, I love this. Delegation of control of Active Directory allows an organization to assign specific administrative tasks to appropriate teams and individuals. Again, I have a help desk to do passwords. I have six people on my help desk. It's easier for me to create a group called help desk, set the permissions there. Kirk's in help desk this week. John's on vacation. He's out. Stephen quit. I'm pulling him out. A week later he comes back says, you know, Aruba just wasn't what it was supposed to be. Can I have my job back? And we just have to put his shoes back in. He's back to the same place. Been to Aruba. Can't help it. <laughs> I have too, and I loved it. Yeah, but how long? What? That we're in Aruba? No, would you stay? Oh, um, it's expensive. <laughs> There's the mm -hmm. point. So, delegation is the result of permissions or access control entries on a discretionary access control list of object or uh, objects in our Active Directory, and the. Discretionary ACLs can be viewed and modified using the advanced security settings of the objects properties dialog box. We have to actually go into that object and go do it. The delegation of control wizard simplifies the underlying complexity of our ACLs by allowing you to assign tasks to groups. And it just says, what do you want to do? Next, next, next. Pow, it's done. Taken care of. Permissions on an object can be reset to their defaults by using the advanced security settings or the DSACL discretionary access list with the reset default DACL switch. And it is best practice to delegate control by using organizational units 
We do those in policies. We create a policy. Whoever's in this organizational unit gets this. It's done. Same thing. Objects within the OUs inherit their permissions from the parent OUs. We can turn that off. We don't have to let it happen. But normally it is a good thing. It is on by default. Inheritance can be modified by disabling inheritance on a child or by applying an explicit permission to a child that's going to override the inherited. Explicit overrides inherited. However, let's think about that. We said a minute ago, a deny is going to overwrite and allow when they are inherited. If I have a disable and then I put an explicit allow, explicit overrides inherited. So the explicit allow will give him that permission. Remember, because we're setting the explicit. Think about it, Kirk. Go ahead. Say the question. It's like the exception. It's an exception. Yeah. Okay. You're inherited. Inherited, everybody gets it no matter what. But I went in and said, Kirk, you know, I only had $5 million. I am giving everybody a dollar, and then the rest of it's going to the cats in Quebec. They're getting four million nine hundred ninety nine thousand dollars. That explicit overrode, you get in a lot more money. Sorry, bud. You know, I like the cats better. Effective permissions are the result of users, groups, allows, denies, inherited, and explicit. Everything. These are their effective permissions. Everything has to be taken into account. Denied permissions, override allows. We know that by default. Those are inherited. Explicit change it. Explicit permissions override inherited. Because we have to do that ourselves manually. Go in and say, you get this. An explicit allow permission overrides an inherited denied. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Why would you have a, a deny permission when you can just not give it in and allow permission? You should just deny it. My class of 2013 has one brainiac, and he comes down and helps with IT every once in a while. And I wanted to give permissions to everybody else in the class of 2013 because he's fixing my entire infrastructure because I have no idea what I'm doing and he seems to be real smart. I can give him some explicit permissions to do things that other people should have access to. Which he had to deny to begin with. He was denied to begin with because everybody in the class of 2013 doesn't have permissions to go play with my Active Directory. Oh, so that's when you would give him an explicit allow permission. That's right. And, and Okay. We're making an exception. He's special. Chapter summary, like I said, you can read those on your own. It forces you to read those on your own. So that really wasn't bad. We're going to stop my little movie, and then I'm going to start one for chapter three.